Today I'm going to introduce the Berkeley Sockets API. Our mission for this lecture is to create a magic number server that sends 4242 and then a new line in ASCII to any client that, client that connects. Then it will close the connection and exit. It will listen on it will listen on TCP port 4242. Then we're going to create a magic number client that connects to the server and receives the data. A server process is a process that listens for inbound connections. There are multiple system calls we need to execute in order to listen for inbound connections and then communicate on the connection. We, first, we use the socket system call, which creates a file descriptor. Then we bind the socket descriptor to a local IP address and port. Then we listen for inbound connections. And then we, we accept the connection. And once we accept a connection, then we can read or write data, or we can use the send or receive functions to, to read or write data. Then when we're done, we can close or shut down the connection. Reading and writing data is usually used for text files on a local system, but you can also read and write to a, a network file descriptor. However, send and receive are designed for the network connections. Likewise, close, you can close the file descriptor, but shutdown is designed for the network connection and is a little bit more graceful. On the client side, it's simpler. We create our socket, which we, we use the socket system call to create our file descriptor, and then we connect to the remote IP address and port. When we connect, it will block until it's connected. And then we can, once we're connected, we can read or write or send or receive to send or receive data. And then when we're done, we can close or shut down. This is the Unix man page for the socket system call, where we're creating an endpoint for communication. We have three parameters. The first is the domain, where we identify whether we're creating the socket in IP version 4 or IP version 6. So we put in, uh, we put, put in the, the PF underscore INET for IP version 4 or PF underscore INET 6 for IP, for IP version 6. There are, you can have other sockets for other types of network protocols, but IP version 4 and IP version 6 are the only two that we're going to worry about. Then you put in the type, which could be a stream. In our case, it could be a stream or a datagram. So uh, if we want a TCP socket, which we usually use, then we'd put in sock underscore stream. If we want a UDP connection, we'd put in a sock underscore datagram. Uh, we also have the ability to create raw sockets where we can we can access raw information off of the, the network interface, but we're, we're not going to do that at this time. And then usually the domain and the type define the protocol without ambiguity. So for example, if our domain is IP version 4 and then the type is um, and then the type is a SOC stream, then the protocol will be TCP, which is 6 and uh, integer 6. If the domain is IP version 4 or IP version 6, and then the type is SOC datagram, then the protocol would be UDP, which is 17, in, which is the integer 17. So usually you don't need to specify the protocol, so usually you'd leave protocol as 0. Here's an example of using the socket system call for my magic number server. I set the domain. Uh, I should have set it to PF underscore INET, but AF underscore INET and PF underscore INET are the same, so uh, I, I was a little imprecise and ended up using AF underscore INET here. So that AF underscore INET is IP version 4. PF underscore INET is also IP version 4. The type, we set the type to SOC stream, so I'm going to be setting up a TCP connection. And then I don't need to set the protocol because IP version 4 and SOC stream uh, definitely means TCP. So then I create my, my socket using the socket system call where 
I've set the domain IP version four, type sock stream, and then the protocol I don't need to specify. And then I check for an error by looking for a negative return value, and uh, at least in Unix, and, um, and then now I have my, my socket opened. The next thing that we need to do is bind our socket to an address. And by an address, I usually mean a local port. The socket's already associated with TCP, so uh, I don't need to specify TCP or UDP anymore, but I, if we're listening for an inbound network connection, we need to identify the port, and we do that by passing it a SOC adder structure. We also need to pass the bind system call our socket, and then since the SOC adder structure might have different lengths, we pass it the length of the SOC adder structure. The trick, however, is getting our SOC adder structure. As you know from our last class, the SOC adder structure is complex. So let's look at another call which can help us get our SOC adder structure in an easier way. This is the get adder info library function. This is a tool to help us get our SOC adder in an easier way. So if we want, we can pass it a host name, which is useful when we're connecting to a remote host. We can pass it a service name, which, I'm sorry, the host name is a string. The service name is also a string, and the service name could be a port number, or it could be the name of a service. So we could pass it 80, or we could pass it HTTP, and those would both work. And then we pass it hints, which is uh, an adder info, which is a structure where we tell it what type of service. So that's where we'd say whether it's a TCP service or a UDP service. And then we pass it a pointer to a pointer to an, ad, uh, an adder info, and that way it will, um, it will give us back our adder info, which will include our sock adder inside it. And then for the hints and for the adder info that we get back, here is the structure where we have the, uh, we can specify the family, we can specify the socket type, we can specify the protocol, and then we have the length of the, the SOC adder and actually our SOC adder. And in some cases, we might get multiple adder infos back depending on what sort of hints we give it. So we, we, if that happens, then we'd, we, it would be in a linked list format. Let's look at an example. So we create an adder info, which we call hints, and that's the hints that we're going to give it. And then we create results, which is a pointer to an adder info. And that will, that will be where we get the answer back. For our hints, we set it to zero. And then we need to specify what we want to specify on the hints. So we don't need to fill in the whole structure. It's all set to zero. We just need to fill in our hints. So for our magic number server, we set it up so it's going to be IPv4. We set it up with a, stock, a sock stream, which means we're going to be listening on TCP. And then for the flags, we're going to set up passive, meaning that we're going to be listening on a local host on any, on any address. Then we call get adder info. And the, the get adder info for the host name, we set it to null because we're listening. So we want to listen on every IP address on the local host. Uh, for our port number, we want to listen on port 4242. We pass it the address of the hints, and then we pass it the address of the results. The results itself is a pointer, so we're passing it a, a, a pointer to a pointer. And it will allocate the memory and give us our results. And then we can use the results. The results includes the AI adder, which is our destination sock adder. So we passed it our hints what kind of address information we want, which remember the sock adder includes the port number. And then when we're creating, doing the bind, we pass it in our socket, we pass in our sock adder, which is in our results. And then we pass in the, the length of the sock adder, which is also in the results. And now our socket is bound. In this case, it's a server. So we're, our socket is bound to listen to TCP port 4242 on our local host. So our socket is bound to port 4242 on the local host, but it's not actually listening for inbound connections yet. 
So we use the listen system call to listen uh, for inbound connections. We specify our socket, and then we specify a backlog, which uh, is how many outstanding connections the kernel can be waiting to pass off to our application if our application is slow to deal with inbound connections. And usually a small integer like 10 is plenty for the backlog. Let's look at our example. We, we execute listen, we pass it our socket, we pass it our backlog of 10, and then we just make sure that our listen didn't fail. Um, and, and there we go. So now we're in our program, we're now, you know, we, we created our socket, we did our get adder info, we, we bound our port, our socket to a particular port, and, and then now we're listening. Once we're listening, we actually need another system call, the accept system call. When we accept a connection, this system call will, when we execute accept, the system call will normally block until we get a new connection. And then we get a new connection, we'll get a new file descriptor for the connection. So we pass the accept, the accept system call, we pass it our socket, and then we pass it a, we pass it a space for a sock adder and the length of the sock adder. And that way, when we accept it, it will fill in the sock adder with the address that we connected it from. Here's our example of using the accept system call. We create a sock adder storage for the remote address. And the sock adder storage is the full 100 and large 128 byte uh, type of sock adder that is large enough to handle sock adders for IPv4 or IPv6. And then we, we have the, we set the address size, we set it to be socklen, type of socklen underscore T, which is just a type of integer. And then we set it to be the size of our sock adder storage. And then we can create our, execute our accept system call. So we pass in our socket. We pass in our sock adder storage, but in this case, we're going to cast it as a, as a, uh, as a pointer to a sock adder. So we're passing in the address of the sock adder storage and then casting the address of the sock adder storage as a pointer to a struct sock adder. And then we pass in the address of the, the address size um, so that the accept system call knows how many bytes our sock adder uh, actually is. The accept system call will block until you receive a connection. There are ways to create sockets so that they, the accept system call does not block and that way you can periodically pull to decide whether to accept. But, but for now, we're just going to execute the accept system call and then our program will stop right here until an inbound connection happens. When the inbound connection happens, we will get a new socket file descriptor, which is the connected socket. And meanwhile, we still have the old socket, which is the listening socket. So then our code, our old socket can go and listen and can go back and accept more new connections while our new socket can deal with the, is specific to the current connection. So we would, you know, this connected socket is where we would send the data. And this other socket is where we'd listen for extra more connections. If we had a loop and one will listen for more connections. For the accept system call, we passed it a sock adder storage, which was empty. And the purpose of that was when we accept a connection, the, the, the kernel will pass us the remote address of the connection back in that sock adder. So then we can go and print it out. Now printing out the inf printing out the remote address in a sock adder is difficult. You remember how complex the structure is. Fortunately, there's a get name info function which makes it easier to print out the remote IP address and port information. So we need we need a buffer for the host name and we set it to zero. We need a buffer for the service name, which is the remote port, and we set it to zero. And then we we need an integer for flags. And then for the flags here, I set it so that we want numbers instead of a name. 
and we want for the host, and we want numbers instead of a service name for the remote port. Then we execute the get name info library call. We pass it in our uh, the address of, uh, of the sock adder from our accept system call. We pass it in the, the size of the, the, uh, the sock adder, and then we pass it in our host name buffer and our service name buffer, and we pass it in our flags. And assuming the connection is successful, then we can we we got the host name in our buffer and we got the service name in our buffer and we can print it out so here you can see we accepted a connection from 127.0.0.1 port 545044 so the get name info went into that sock adder and got the the address and port information out for us which is nice and that way, when you receive network connections, you can use this bit of code in order to print out the remote IP address and port. Next, we want to actually send, we're, we're connected. We were listening, we accepted a connection, uh, uh, and now we just want to send our data. So let's use the send system call. To send our data, we have our, uh, we need to specify the socket to send the data on. We need a a string, a buffer with our, we need a buffer with our data, and then we need our, uh, to know how many bytes to send in the buffer. Now the buffer, note it's a pointer to void, so we could be sending uh, different types of data in the buffer. It doesn't necessarily need to be an ASCII string, it could be binary data. Let's look at our example. Our message is a pointer to car, so it's a string, and it is 4242 and then new line, and then for size of message, we need our, our string length, and then we, 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 we execute our send system call. We have our connected socket. We need not our listening socket. We send on our connected socket. We have the message. We have the string length of the message, so we're going to send the, the five bytes, and then our send flags are zero. And then we will the send system call will return how many bytes are sent, in some circumstances, this could be less than the number that you wanted to send, especially if you had a very large message. And dealing with that is something that we will cover later in the term. For now, we just assume that only one send is necessary. And then we, we, we print out our, uh, and then I actually print out how many bytes were sent. And if the bytes were sent did not equal the bytes I wanted to send, it'll print out a warning message. In this case, our size of message was five, and then we five bytes sent, so it's successful. The shutdown system call is a more graceful way to terminate a network connection than a close system call. In addition, so when, with the shutdown system call, we pass it our socket, and then we also give it an integer how, where there are different flags that can be set to say whether we want to shut it down for receiving data or sending data or both. Let's look at our example. So we we set our how, an integer how to be shut down read write. So we want to shut down data in both directions. And then I execute the shutdown system call uh, of our socket, read write, and assuming it succeeds, then I just go ahead and close the socket. And then I'm done and I can actually exit the program. Okay, so I've got my magic number server, and I'm running it, and it's listening for a connection, and then I need to test it. And the way I test it is by using Telnet. Now, Telnet is a program which just opens up a TCP connection to a remote host, and it's sometimes used for interactive logins. It's not encrypted, so most operating systems today have Telnet disabled by default. I recommend you, figure, you get a Telnet client for your system some way, somehow. Uh, so Google search on getting a Telnet client. Windows has a Telnet client built in, but it's disabled. So you need to find Google instructions for enabling it. So on my Mac, I have a Telnet client installed. I Telnet to localhost port 4242. It actually tried over IPv6 and failed because I wasn't listening on IPv6. And then the Telnet client was actually smart enough to try again over IPv4 and it connected and then it received 4242 and then the new line, and then the remote end connect, closed the connection. 
Let's go back to the big picture. We've now implemented our server. And in our server, we use the socket system call to create a file descriptor. We associated it with our local port 4242. We did not specify a local IP so the server would listen on all local IP addresses. We listened, we, we, we enabled listening for a connection, and then we we accepted a connection. So we, we executed the accept system call and we blocked there until we received a connection. And then once we received a connection, we, in that case from Telnet, we wrote our data to it using the send call, and then we shut down and closed our connection. Let's look at it from the client side. The client side, we also need a socket file descriptor. And then we need to connect to the remote IP address. In this case, the remote IP address will be, since I'm testing on the same host, will be 127.0.0.1. And the remote port will be port 4242. And when I execute the connect call, it will block until the connection is, is accepted. And then we will, uh, in that case, we will read our data and then we can close or shut down our connection. When programming a client, you usually want to pass in the host name and port into the command line arguments. But it's also helpful to have a default host name and a default port, uh, for, particularly for your development when you're working in an IDE and passing command line arguments is a little inconvenient. So here's an example of how I do that. I, I have my main function and I create a buffer for the host name. I create a buffer for the port. Uh, the buffers are 100 bytes long. I put default values in them. And then if the command line arguments, if I have enough command line arguments, then I copy the host name into the, uh, uh, into the buffer. And if, I, uh, if my command line arguments are large enough, I copy the port into the buffer. In this case, uh, I'm using strl copy, which is nice because it always null terminates the string. Uh, but this is not part of the C standard library, so it's possible it may not exist on your system. First step in the client is to create my socket file descriptor. With my domain, I set it to IP version 4, AFINET, or I could do PFINET. The type, uh, I set it to a stock stream. Uh, then I don't need to specify the protocol because IPv4 with a stock stream uh, uh, uniquely identifies protocol TCP. Then I execute my socket system call, and now I have my socket file descriptor. Keep in mind the socket system call does not actually send any data over the network yet. You're just creating your socket, your socket data structure. You don't actually send data until your later system calls. Now we're going to use get adder info to get our, our, our sock adder to connect to the remote host. So we create our hints. And then we create a result, which is a pointer to an adder info, which is going to be for our results. We set our hints to be zero. And then we set it to IPv4 socket stream. And then we use our get adder info. Then we'll use our get adder info. We have the host name buffer from our prior slide. We have our port buffer from our prior slide. We pass it the address of the hints and the address of the results. <coughs> and we get our results. Next, we're going to use our connect system call to connect to the remote host. We need to pass it our socket. We need to pass it our sock adder, which we got back from our get adder info, and the length of our, our, our sock adder. Here's our example. We connect on our socket to, remember we had our results from our get adder info, and the AI adder is our sock adder inside there. And then the AI adder length is the 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 size of the the sock the particular sock adder, and then we check our return status. Here we ran it twice. the The first time I ran it with no server listening on the remote side. So we we created our socket, we did our get adder info, and then we tried to connect and it failed. The connection was refused. That means we we talked on the network to a remote host and so we did our tcp sin and the remote host replied or i'm sorry the remote host uh, 
wasn't listening on that port, so it actually sent us a a a it, it actually sent us an error message. Here we ran it again, where the magic number server was actually listening on port four two four two on the target host, where we we opened up our we created our socket data structure, we did our get adder info, and then we actually did the connect, and the connect successfully completed. So now we have a TCP connection to the remote host. Now we use the receive system call to receive a message on our connected socket. Here's our example. We create a, a buffer, a string buffer to for the data, and we set the buffer to zero. Uh, and then we have integers for flags and for bytes received. And then those are all set to zero. And then I use received. We pass it our socket. We pass it our buffer and the buffer length minus one because we want the the buffer to always be null terminated. And keep in mind that the buffer we that's one reason why we explicitly set the buffer to zero. So if we if we receive a string of 99 bytes in our buffer of size 100, well the receive isn't going to give us null terminate our string for us, but because we've got that extra byte in our buffer that is already set to zero, the string will always be null terminated. So while we're receiving bytes, so while it is not equal to zero, the, re the result is not equal to zero, if we get a positive number from the receive, then that's how many bytes we received. If we get a negative number back, then an error failed. And if we get a zero back, then we are done receiving because the socket has been shut down by the remote side, and then we can exit out of our while. So in this case, I run it. My program connects to the magic number server. It receives 4242 new line. That gets passed into the buffer, and we print it out. And then the while loop will go around again. It will attempt to receive, but the remote side will shut down the connection. One thing about the receive is you block, you normally block waiting to receive data unless you do something special. So we haven't done anything special here, so we're blocked waiting to receive. The remote side shuts down, so then we get a zero back from the receive, meaning that we're done, and then the while no longer continues and we, we exit out of the while loop, and in this case, that means exiting out of the program. Here's the same program where I modified my magic number server to print out something larger and I changed my buffer length to 10 so that way I'm uh, the the message that I the total message to be transmitted is longer than the buff length and in this case it 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 looped around once and I got the first nine bytes into my buffer and then it looped around again and it got more nine, nine more bytes into the buffer and so on until I got the whole message. And you can see it successfully printed out the whole message. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So let's review this one more time. This time I'll start it with the client. The client, we use the socket system call to create our file descriptor. We connect to the remote side. Uh, the connect system call will block until we get a response of some kind, or it will eventually time out if we try to connect to a server that does not exist. Then we can send or receive data, and at the end we can close or shut down, although my example I actually did not include uh, putting in the close or shutdown. On the server, we use the socket to create our file descriptor. We have to bind that to a local port and we could bind it to a local IP address, but usually you just want to listen in all IP addresses on a particular server unless you're doing something special. Then we listen for inbound connections. We start listening for inbound connections, and then we, we use the accept system call to uh, receive a connection one at a time. And the accept system call will actually give us another socket. So after we accept, we will have a connected socket which is connected to a remote side, and then we'll still have our listening socket that is listening for additional connections. And then on the connected socket, we can, uh, uh, we can send or receive data, and, and then when we're done, we can, we can shut down our, our connected socket and also shut down our listening socket. Let's talk about what we've not done on the master number server. 
we have not attempted to listen simultaneously for connections on IPv4 and IPv6. We, we have not continued receiving new connections after service, servicing a previous one. We just received one connection and sent it data. Uh, on the magic number server, we have not received any data. We sent data. And then on the server, we have not switched between doing work on the server and serving data. So we're, 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 listening, we're listening for the network connection. We're blocked, uh, uh, waiting to accept an inbound connection, and our program is not doing anything else. Whereas with a game server, for example, you would want to be doing calculations on the server and then periodically go and take a look for new connections. So those are more advanced features that we will need to learn later. On the magic number client, what have we not done? Well, we have not attempted to connect on both IPv4 and IPv6. In our client, we were only connecting on IPv4. We have not sent any data. We only received data. And again, we have not switched between doing work on the client and transmitting or receiving data. All we did is we connected, and then we received data until there was none, and then we exited. And uh, 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 for those of you at home, please make sure to look at the can review canvas to see what homework is done, and go do a lab. Thank you.